there, but I didn't have the time. But I'll, I'll try to get in there. <laughs> Ken was born in the Blue Hills. That's how we all got him. He was born to a Swedish mother and a Polish father. How they landed up into the Blue Hills is kind of a story by itself. <laughs> Our mother moved with her family from North Branch at the age of 14. At that time, you could homestead 40 acres and the land was yours. Well, she lived there until she got old enough to work and her and her twin sister then left and went back to St. Paul. She met this guy and they got married. They moved to Florida. But sorry to say, down in Florida, he contacted tuberculosis and he didn't live very long. So she moved back to St. Paul. <clears throat> and shortly after that, her father called her home to take care of her ailing mother. So that's how she got into the Blue Hills. Mm -hmm. My father was born to Polish immigrants and they they basically did the same thing. They, they homesteaded 40 acres at Weyerhaeuser. Well, my dad went to Chicago for a while and worked, and he came back to Weyerhaeuser, and he too decided to homestead 40 acres in the Blue Hills. And it just happened to be one half mile from where my mother lived. So I guess the rest is history. <laughs> Growing up in the Blue Hills for Ken, to a poor family that tried to make a living out of farming, logging, or however they could. As sibling and as a family, we were a very, very close family. It may also because we all lived in a one-room house, two floors, one on the one on the bottom floor and the top floor. And it couldn't have been much more than 25 by 30 feet long. So we were never, never, ever apart for 24, 24 seven a day. So that may have contributed to being close. We, the downstairs was the, the kitchen area, the living area with a barrel stove in between to keep us warm. And upstairs was one big bedroom. Four or five beds, we all slept upstairs. So as I say, we were never apart for 24 seven, and that may be why we were close. And also the, the Blue Hills was, was very sparsely populated. So we didn't have any neighbors. So all we had was the four of us. And we did each and everything we did together. Later on, the, the house was, was expanded uh, after Ken had left. Now, Ken had to grow up much faster uh, in his high school years because my father took a job at the local foundry and also patrolling his grades. So Ken, Ken was left with all of the farming. And the only crew he had was myself and my younger brother, Bob, and our cousin, Wayne. And I tell you, that, that was quite a crew to work with. <laughs> he, he was the boss, and he dared out that detail very well. I can remember one time when, when he, he was, we were hay, and um, we did all the work with horses. And um, one day Ken was out raking hay with the old dump rake, you know, and uh, the horses we had were from the west and they were wild broncos. The first little sound of noise, they took off, headed back for the barn. And we could see the, the horses coming across the field at a high rate of speed, the rate bouncing up and down, and no Ken. We were convinced he was dead. But a few minutes to our surprise, he come walking across the field and he had made it home. When Ken was in high school, one of his biggest pastimes was hunting. Hunting in the Blue Hills. Later on, his brother Bob carried on that tradition. I did not. And Ken was very good at hunting. When he was in high school, some of his buddies 
had found this old wood chopper's cabin that was, uh, was uh, left and was in disarray. Him and his buddy put it all back together to make it livable. Well, of course, I think that was questionable whether it was livable or not. But they got it together as their own personal hunting shed. I took up hunting a little bit during that time, but he never wanted to hunt with me. He said I was too noisy in the, in the uh, woods. And I scared every deer away. So every morning, he would ask me, uh, which direction are you going, Don? I'd say, I'm going east. He went west. <laughs> and like I say, hunting was, was, was in it. One, I can remember one, one evening, a deer wandered a little too close to the house. And he shot the darn thing off our back porch. And of course, no one had electricity at that time up there, so the deer, they cut the deer off, and of course, they distributed it to the neighbors because he had to get rid of it and eat it all in one day. So everybody in the neighborhood had uh, uh, meat that time. Mm -hmm. One other funny story with Ken and his hunting. He was hunting this day, and uh, hunting was big in, in the Blue Hills. Everybody came up to the Blue Hills to hunt during those days. And he had shot a doe. And uh, of course, with everybody hunting up there, the game wardens were about as plentiful as the, as the hunters. So, so he told Bob and I to get in the Model A. We threw in a blanket, and we drove down the road to where he had dragged the deer out into the ditch next to the road. We loaded the dang thing in the back seat of the Model A. He threw the blanket over and told Bob and I, now sit on the deer. <laughs> so we, obediently, we sat on the deer. He said, now if a game warden stops us, say nothing. I'll do all the talking. <laughs> so, but but hunting, hunting is something he took up, you know, and he, he, he continued that his whole life. Hunting was big for him. It seemed like he always returned to the Blue Hills to hunt. This was a, a love that he had. Now, Ken was the first member of our family to leave home and to fill my father's wishes. He always told us, you know, get out of these hills. There's a bigger life out there, go find it. So he was the first one to break away from the Bruce Hills. He joined the Air Force. While he was in the service, I started college at Northern College. And I attended school with many of the veterans that were there under the GI Bill. And at the end of my first year, I was going to transfer to La Crosse. And I said, Ken, you know, you have the GI Bill. Why don't you take the GI Bill and go to school with me? And he did. And he did. We lived together for about two and a half years till I went in the Army. And he was, he was the old man of the house. There were four of us living in the house. He was the old man. And furthermore, he had a car. So <laughs> we, we, we didn't want to mess with Ken. He had the car. But he, he kept us straight in order. And the things that went on for that two and a half years, I, I don't think Ken would want me to share a lot of our non-academic <laughs> activities, except we did have a few cakers on top of uh, Granddad Bluff. <laughs> Chip Chip knows where that's at. <laughs> now, Ken graduated and took his first job in Trillers. He was dedicated to teaching. His program was read exactly as he was taught at the University of La Crosse by that program. He went far beyond than just taking a ball, throwing it out there, telling the kids to run around, and then send them back to class. His lesson plans always contained activities, not only to design to, to teach them the skills that they needed during the game, but to get them moving. His teaching touched many students in Phillips and Marshfield, and he truly was a physical education teacher. He took it serious and did a tremendous job of, of doing it. While teaching in Marshfield, Ken, Ken would go to Canada fishing with some of his uh, colleagues. They would leave right after school started, and Ken would tell us sometimes they would get up there and there'd still be ice on the lake in Canada. And it was cold. And so he, he didn't, didn't particularly care for that. So he decided to start his own group, a family group. A 
And that's how we got started at the Cash and Lake. We always look forward to going to the Cash and Lake. And as the nephews got old enough, they could go. The nieces could not. It was off limits. Off limits. But uh, as they got old enough, they also joined us in Canada. And that, that would be a four hour talk in itself to talk about our trip to Canada. Mm -hmm. Wayne, our cousin Wayne, which was really actually raised as a, as a brother, was also part of that. And Wayne had sent me a short note that he would like me to read at this time. For about four years when I was a young teenager, I used to spend the summers on the Kohik farm to avoid the, Polish, the, the polio risk and the inner city of St. Paul. This was a wonderful time for me because I was really accepted as part of the family. I even milked cows, and when we had them loaded with hay, Stanley, my dad, and Ken's dad would let him drive the horses. Don and Bob were almost like brothers to me. Ken was our oldest brother. When Stanley worked at the foundry, Ken was the boss. One day, Ken needed to go to the gravel pit about a half mile down the road to get some gravel. He asked me to go with him, but when he tossed me the keys, he said, you drive. I was only 12 or 13, but to me, it, it means that I really was going to be driving. I was going to step on the gas, I was going to run the brake, the whole thing. This is one thing for me that told me Ken had just put his stamp of approval on me. Hmm. Leaving Wayne's letter, I have another story about Ken's driving. I don't know exactly how old he was. You know, at that time, he, when you got a license, it was kind of immature. You, kind of, you drove when you could reach the pedals and off you went. And it wasn't really that close. But for some reason, our parents were not at home. And Ken decided he would take Joanne, Bob, and I for a ride in the Model A. Well, I guess he knows what he's doing, you know. So we all loaded into the Model A. He got the darn thing started. And down the driveway we went. And of course, those of you that are old enough to uh, remember the Model A, they didn't have the power steering that we have nowadays. And I think we were going a little too fast and we got to the main road when he started, he didn't have enough strength to turn the wheel. We went right off the end of the driveway and into the ditch. <laughs> well, we were panicking. What are we going to do? Oh, calm Ken. He had the solution. We went out, rounded up those two wild broncos we had, and he harnessed them up. And we, went, we pulled the darn car out. And to this day, I don't think our, our parents even knew that. <laughs> he, he'd taken us for a ride. He, he knew how to solve the problem. I have, he, um, he also says, I had a lot of fond memories of Ken as I got older too. There was a Flamel River trip with him and the doc and their great storytelling. And they're going off script again. The doc he refers to is Dr. Burns. He went on a canoe trip once. And the side story to this is Brother Ken. We, we, we got down on the river and the, about three in the morning, the, the heavens opened up and it poured rain, poured rain. We got up in the morning and it was just still raining, so we decided, we're gonna change it. Let's come back to Phillips and uh, let's stay there and get dry. I don't know if you were around or not, but probably not, but we all ended up back at your house. <laughs> and we started drinking a little beer and playing poker. And, uh, and also about three in the afternoon, the sun came up, brilliant. And Ken in his infinite wisdom says, Let's hit the river. What? Yes, let's go. We got time. So he said, we, we don't have to take much with us. We're only going to be overnight. You just, just grab your sleeping bag and let's go. So we, we listened to Ken and we went. So we camped there and um, got time to go to bed, which was probably close to morning. Uh, we put the two canoes together. We put a big tarp over the canoes and we slept underneath it in our sleeping bag. Well, lo and behold, you guessed it. About three in the morning, the heavens opened up again. <laughs> and that tarp got full of water, started sagging apparently. All of a sudden, it let go all at once. <laughs> Us in our sleep bag, we darn near drowned in our sleeping bag. 
Well, I don't think Ken had a very interesting night as we're drawing on him. You know, no tent, no food. No, no. So I don't think that was probably one of his most enjoyable trips. <laughs> Later, Ken found, I'm back to Wayne's letter again. Later, Ken had found a place to fish in Canada that was accessible only about 50 miles of a very long, tough road. Ken was the organizer of all the trips, and he included what food we should take on the, on the trip. I was to bring enough spam for everyone. <laughs> and that, 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 that of all the, of all the, um, the, the, the nephews, that's the standing joke, the spam, the spam, the spam. We always had a big spam. So he had to bring about 13 cans of spam. At the border, he said they, they surely thought he was smuggling something besides spam, and they really checked him out. We camped out on an island, and after about three days, Ken announced again one morning, today is the day we change shorts. <laughs> Don, you change with Bob. <laughs> Wayne, you change with Greg. Johnny, you change with Wally. It brought a big laugh, but of course this was typical of, of the activities that we had up in Canada. There was always a laugh here and there about something. Ken has left a lot of great memories for everyone. But he has left a legacy of love. Ken and the whole Kolick family have been very special to me all my life. Wayne. Wayne, along with my, three of my sons, send their condolences for not being able to be here because of travel restrictions and some other things they were not able, able to make it. Ken was more than a brother to me. He taught me many life skills. He was kind and gentle. I really can't remember a time he ever raised his voice. I, I, I really can't remember that, you know. But he had a way of viewing life and how the world should be. And he kind of let you know that from time to time. Ken, I, I do miss you. And I will soon Two together will be together again. So until that time, I say, rest in peace. In closing, I would like to thank Nancy for her Facebook entry, for those beautiful remembrances of your father that you so eloquently wrote, and I quote, he was a wonderful husband, father, grandfather, friend, educator, and motivator. And that's exactly is how he would want to be remembered. And Marge, I want to thank you with all the care and the love that you've given Ken over the last few years of his illness. It was far beyond expectations. And I know even though he couldn't tell you, deep in my heart, I believe he knew. <laughs> 